for an extraordinary life. I wonder if you're ready, you just don't know it yet. I was a 15-year-old eighth grader here in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Grew up going to church. In fact, I used to joke that uh, as a kid, I had a drug problem as a, as a middle schooler. My parents are here today. This may be frightening to them to hear, but it's not like you think. My drug problem was every Sunday morning, my parents drug me to church. <laughs> and every Sunday night, they drug me to church. And Wednesday night, I got drugged to youth group. And, and so my whole life, I had been drugged to church. Has anybody been drugged before like that? You've been drugged to church? Anybody honest enough to say you got drugged here this morning by somebody? Okay, thank you. Thank you for that honesty. And, uh, and so I went to church, but... Basically, I was there physically, but mentally, emotionally, spiritually, I had to be somewhere else. In other words, for me as a kid growing up as a teenager, I thought that God was true and real and that Christianity was meaningful and that someday when I was really, really old, it would become important to me to have a relationship with God. In other words, faith matters. It just, faith matters. It just doesn't matter right now. I wonder if there's anybody listening to me today that would say, oh, I think faith matters, but the reality is it may not really matter right now in the way that really God wants it to. And so my brother, who was uh, walking with the Lord and, and active in our church, he began to pray for me. In fact, I found out later my brother had our entire youth group praying for his little brother, Stephen, praying that God would speak to me, that God would call me, that I would experience a life-changing relationship with Christ. In fact, his big goal was to try to get me to go on these youth trips over the summer. Now, the first trip was a mission trip to New York City, and our youth choir of our local church was singing the national anthem at a New York Yankees game in Yankee Stadium. Now, that got me interested. So I wasn't really... was involved, but I wasn't really involved. So I didn't really know everybody, and I went in there. How many of you know it's important how you treat new people when they come to church or a small group? And I remember sitting there, and there was this one boy that was kind of teasing me and picking at me and throwing stuff at me. And when that rehearsal was over, I told my brother, even, even Yankee Stadium wasn't going to get me to go on that trip with that kid. And I, and I didn't go back. Sure enough, they went on their trip, they, they ministered in New York City, they did backyard Bible clubs, they sang at Yankee Stadium. They came back and on Sunday night, my parents drug me to church to hear them do their concert and share their story about their trip. But something strange happened to me that night. Sitting in the pew, sitting like you're sitting in this church building right now, one by one, several of these kids got up and shared about their relationship with Christ, what it meant to them, the difference that it had made in their lives. They began to talk about how God had dealt with them, met with them, spoke to them, called them, and how they were now following him as a result of this trip. And sitting in that room that night, I'll be very honest with you. Now, this is my testimony. I wasn't sure I wanted what those kids had. It seemed a little strange to me. I wasn't 100% sure that I wanted that kind of relationship with God. However, I was very, very curious because I think for the first time in my life, it had dawned on me they had something that I simply did not have. 
And the reality was I grew up in a good home with good parents, went to good schools, had good friends. I was good at school, good with sports. The reality was I had a really good life. But when I would go to bed at night, I can remember as a teenager laying my head on my pillow in a very comfortable home, in a comfortable neighborhood, with a very comfortable life, I just felt this feeling in my stomach, and I mean it was visceral. It was like palpable. I would lie in bed at night, and I would stare at the ceiling, and I would think, there's got to be more than this. There's got to be more to life than just winning the game, getting the grade, getting the girl, going to college, getting a job, having the house, There has to be more than this. And that Sunday night, listening to those teenagers share about their relationship with Christ, I I realized I I didn't want to stay where I was. I wanted to at least kick the tires and check this Christianity thing out. And so on a Sunday night after church, I walked up to that man right there, and I said, hey, I didn't sign up to go on that camp. Their buses were leaving at 7 a.m. the next morning. The deadline to go on this trip had passed weeks ago. I walked up to my parents and I said, hey, if the youth minister says okay, can, can I go on that trip? Can I go to that youth camp? Little did I know my brother had 80 teenagers praying that I would go on that trip. <laughs> so when I went up to the youth minister, his name was Denny, and I said, hey, Denny, is it too late for me to go on that trip? He kind of gave me a, a smile and a wink and a nod like he had known this moment was coming. He said, sure, you can go. And the next morning, I got on a charter bus with those kids, and I went up, and literally, from that week until today, my life has never been the same. Now, I'm not what I ought to be today. I'm not what I ought to be, don't get me wrong. I can just tell you this. I'm not what I was The Gospel of Mark says it this way, John baptized people with water, but there's one coming who baptizes people with the Holy Spirit. What he's saying is, you really can exchange ordinary living for an extraordinary life. Are you ready for Jesus who says, follow me? If you have your Bible, open to Mark chapter 1, excuse me. Open up your Bible to Mark chapter 1. We're going to begin reading in verse 16 today as we begin our new series, 40 Days of Influence. And we're talking about how you can know Christ and make him known. Listen to what he says in Mark chapter 1, beginning in verse 16. Are you with me? Mark 1, verse 16. And now as Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. Famously, the King James says, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Look at verse 18. At once they left their nets. And they followed him. When he had gone a little farther, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother John in a boat preparing their nets. And without delay, he called them. And they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men, and they followed him. These these few verses reveal three tools that everybody needs to have an extraordinary life. How many of you know that discipleship is not just a destination? Discipleship is a journey. How many know that disciples are born and disciples are also made? That's a kind of a common question in business. In the business world, people say, are leaders born or are they made? Psychologists talk about the issue of nature versus nurture. But in a spiritual context, the Bible says Uh, disciples are both born, they're born of God, this is something only God does in us, but they are also made. Jesus said if you follow him, he will make you something, he will do something, he will work in 
and through you. So discipleship is both a a journey and a destination. Disciples are both uh, born and made. And finally, being a disciple is about both knowing Christ and also making him known. So 40 days of influence is all about 40 days of asking God to influence you and then asking God to use you to influence others. How many of you want God to work in your life? You want God to work in you? You want to know him better? How many of you are ready for God to not only work in you, but how many want God to work through you and use you in some way to change the world one life at a time for the glory of God? Well, this morning, if you have something to write with, you should have gotten a little half sheet with with some notes, because as we talk today about the question, are you ready? I'm going to give you three tools for an extraordinary life. Three things that everybody in this world needs. Now, I'm just going to give you a little tip here for free on the side. Are you ready? Let me just give you a little side, a little dessert. The principles I'm about to give you are the same principles that every family needs, every business needs, every team needs, every nation needs. Everybody needs three things. Are you ready? You can write them down. Number one, everybody needs a compass. Everybody needs a compass. Number two, everybody needs a map. And number three, everybody needs a passport. Now, if these 40 days are really going to be life-changing for you, what you need to discover here in Mark chapter 1, verses 16 to 20, is that God has a compass. God has a vision for your life. God has a map. That is, God has a mission for your life. It's not just a question of where am I going. It's also a question of how do I get there. And finally, everybody needs a passport. And friends, God wants to give you a not just a vision and a sense of mission and purpose. But listen, God wants to give you a passion for your life. Are you ready? Look at what he says in verse 16 and 17 and 18. First of all, everybody needs a compass. You say, Pastor Stephen, where do you find that? Look at verse 16. As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he what? He what? He saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake. Go down to verse 19. When he'd gone a little farther, he what? He saw James and John. Uh, the sons of Zebedee. When Jesus walked by, he saw them. Now, how many of you remember, if you were here last Sunday, I told you that in 1 John, I think it's like 30 or 40 times, we find the word knowledge or know. 12 or 13 times in those five short chapters, John says, we know. Nine times in chapter 5, we see that word know or knowledge. Eight out of the nine times that it's used, that word that we know, it's the same root word that's used in Mark chapter 1 when it says Jesus saw those early disciples, those four men. Andrew, Simon, James, John. When he saw Peter, Simon Peter, what, what does it mean? It's the same word that John uses for knowing someone. What it means is to perceive, to know by seeing. In other words, to simplify it, here's what it says. What it says is, Jesus didn't just see those fishermen. Listen, he saw through those fishermen. He didn't just see them optically. He saw them spiritually. He didn't just see their resume, their biography, their appearance, he didn't just see them, he saw what was underneath them, what they were thinking, what they were feeling. How many of you know that he sees you? You can write that down in your notes. Everybody needs a compass, and where do we get that compass from? We get it from the vision that God has for our lives. He sees me. He sees you. 
He sees us. He doesn't just see us. He sees us through us. Look at what it says in 2 Chronicles chapter 16 and verse 9. It should be on your screen. 2 Chronicles 16 and verse 9. Do we have that, guys? For the eyes of the Lord range, they roam throughout the earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. He goes on to talk about the struggle they were having at that time, but the, but the principle is this. The same Bible that says Satan is like a roaring lion, he goes about the whole earth, he's roaming through the earth, seeking whom he may devour. The same time Satan is walking around town looking for people to get in trouble, Jesus is walking around the same town. It sounds like Proverbs, where wisdom and folly are both standing on the hill, announcing and calling out to the people, come to me. Satan, the Bible says, the enemy has come to steal, kill, and destroy. Jesus says, I have come that you may have life. Certainly, that's what he's talking about when it says he walked along the Sea of Galilee and he saw Daniel. He saw Patrick. He saw Claudia. He saw Warren. He saw Andrew, Simon, James, John. And when he saw them, he saw who they were created to be. He saw his purpose for them. Isn't it interesting? Jesus doesn't see these men for who they are. He sees them for who they can be. How many of you ever heard this phrase, well, it is what it is? Have you ever heard that? How many of you say that on a regular basis? Man, it just, hey, it is what it is. Looking at Pat Panera this morning, I remember your mom and, and, uh, and I remember you telling me that, that that was one of her phrases. Whatever was going on, she'd just smile in her inimitable way and, and, and just kind of twinkle in her eye, and she'd say, hey, it is what it is. Say that with me. It is what it is. Now, is that good theology? Everybody take out your phone. Will you do me a favor real quick? How many of you have a phone with you? Got your phone? By the way, while we're at it, everybody turn your ringer off, if you don't mind. (laughs) We'd appreciate that. Try to remember that for every week. But um, do me a favor. Can you just take your phone and go to the camera and push your camera? Everybody got that? And and here's what I want you to do. Um, Turn it around, you know, where it's at. By the way, does anybody want to lose 20 pounds? Anybody want to lose 20 pounds? All right, you ready? Hold your phone just like this and just take a picture of yourself. Take a selfie. Boom. Everybody got it? All right, now, you want to lose 20 pounds? Take a picture like this. There you go. Kim Kardashian, listen to this. Kim Kardashian has a book for sale in the bookstore and on Amazon for the bargain price of $69. You can purchase her book The title of her book is Selfish. Now, do you want to know what the great literary figure of the 21st century does in her $69 hardback book? It's a collection of selfies that she has taken. So if you want to see her favorite pictures of herself, you can pay $69 and have that (laughs) coffee table book. Don't everybody run out right now to go get it, but why is that important? Why is everybody taking pictures of themselves? Well, because the way you see yourself, the psychologists say it's the law of correspondence. You know, what's going on on the inside of you has the greatest impact of what's going on on the outside of you. How many know that we don't see things the way they are? What do you mean we don't see things the way they are? Pastor Stephen, what are you talking about? No, we don't see things the way they are. We see things the way we are. Do you notice that communication is not what is said? Often communication is what is heard. I'll give you a perfect example. Have you ever said something to someone innocently with no malice and they took it in a negative way? Why? Because the way you see things 
influences everything else. When you take that picture of yourself, friends, it's more than just a, a harmless, thoughtless, little, uh, you know, silly thing that's not a big deal. How you see yourself is the whole ballgame. I want to ask you a question. Why did Jesus choose those four men? Have you ever thought about that? Of all the people in Palestine that he could have walked by and said, follow me, he chose Simon, Andrew, James, and John. Do you think he chose them because there was something so special and unique about their gifts and talent and background? That pr- How many of you acknowledge, if you think about it, he chose them for the very reason there was nothing supernatural, significant. But they were fishermen. They weren't rabbis. They, they, he didn't go and pick the national honor student. He basically, what Jesus said is, he said, uh, I remember William F. Buckley used to say that he would rather be governed by the first 12 names in the Boston phone book than by the Boston City Council. In other words, Jesus basically said, hey, just give me four guys. Just give me four people that no one on this planet would expect to turn this world upside down and let me spend some time with them and let me teach them what it means to follow me. Let me tell them all about this kingdom. It's not a kingdom of this world, but it's a spiritual kingdom that they can come and they can follow me and they can know me and they can live in me and with me and through me and I will make something of them that, that they could never see. Jesus said, you're fishing for fish, but I'm going to show you how to fish for men. I don't see you for what you are. I see you for what you can be. The eyes of the Lord roam throughout the whole earth, seeking those whose hearts are fully committed to him. Isn't that an interesting verse? Go back to 2 Chronicles 16, 9 for just a second. The eyes of the Lord range throughout the whole earth. To what? What is God looking for? What's the secret to experiencing God's vision? He's, He's... His eyes, his vision is to strengthen those whose what? Hearts are fully committed to him. In other words, what Jesus was saying was those four disciples, they could exchange ordinary living for an extraordinary life if they just turned their lives over to him. How many of you think your life, now don't raise your hand, I'm not trying to ridicule or pick on anybody, but I want you to think about this. How many of you here today would say, my life is really not all that special. My life is good, it's okay, it's, sometimes it's great, you know, but, um, but my life is not really all that special. How many of you know that if you took your life and put it in God's hands, all of a sudden water would turn into wine? How many of you think you can do more with your life than God can? You think God might be able to do more with your life than you have been able to? I'm going to tell you right now, my biggest problem in life stares me in the face every morning in the mirror. Friend, the biggest problem I've got is not out there. It's right here. And the Bible says, Jesus, first of all, he saw them. He sees you. And don't miss the significance of that. Everybody needs a compass. Everybody needs a sense of where true north is. What is my purpose? What is God's design? And friend, you're only going to find that Meaning, when you begin to see yourself the way God sees you. Everybody needs a compass. Realize that God sees you. And he doesn't see you for what you are. He sees you for what you can be. That you can know him. And you can help make him known. But I want you to see a second thing that I think is interesting. Not only does everybody need a compass, but secondly, everybody needs a map. We don't just need to know where we're going. We need to know how to get there. 
Look again at verse 16. Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee. He saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net in the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me. Do you see that in verse 17? Jesus says, come, follow me. Some translations simply say, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. Other translations say, come to me. This one in the NIV, it says, come, follow. And I will send you out to fish for people. At once, they left their nets and they followed him. Look at verse 19. When he'd gone a little farther, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John in a boat, preparing their nets. Look at verse 20. Without delay, he what? Called them. Now, this word for call that's used here in these verses, that, that <clears throat> it says, Jesus says, follow me, come to me, is interesting. It's one of the most common verbs uh, in the New Testament, this word for call. It can mean to cry out with a loud voice. It can mean to call someone like you're inviting them to something. It can mean to call someone by name. It, it, it speaks of the way that God is trying to get our attention and get us to join him on this journey. I remember when I was a kid, <clears throat> around the same time that I told you that story about coming to faith in Christ at that youth camp, um, <clears throat> there was a, the school year ended. And how many, when you're a kid, how many loved the last day of school? I mean, it was just so fun. You get out of school, you're out for the whole summer. And you remember when you were little and it didn't get dark till 8.30 at night. And I mean, in my neighborhood, we would play until, you know, the cats came home until we, our parents wouldn't let us stay out anymore. And in our family, we had a whistle. Did anybody have a whistle in your house? And in our, our family, we had a whistle, and the whistle sounded like this. In fact, everybody do that with me real quick. Doesn't that bring back some memories right there? And, uh, and I can remember being out there in the street. We were playing chase around the block. Have you ever heard of that game? Chase around the block, and we were hiding, and we were all up and down our street. And uh, the door swung open in my house. The sun had gone down. It was getting dark. It's probably 8, uh, 8.30 at night, and uh, all the neighborhood kids were out. We were all roaming the neighborhood, and I heard this, this whistle. <whistles> and I turned around and looked, and there was my father standing on the front steps of our house. He said, Stephen James, which was never a good sign. I said, yeah, Dad. He said, time for supper. Come on inside. We're eating. And I said, oh, Dad, please, please, please. And I began the negotiation. And I said, can I just stay out a little bit longer? Please, we're all playing chase around the block. Everybody else's parents are letting them. Are you guys with me? You've heard this speech. I've given this speech and listened to this speech many times in my life. I said, please, please, please. I said, if you'll just let me stay out a little longer, I promise the next time you call me, I'll come in immediately. He said, do you mean it? I said, yes, yes, I promise. I got all excited. He'd never said yes before. <clears throat> he said, all right. He turned around, went inside. About one second later, he opened the door and came back out. <laughs> I was like, oh, man. Never try to negotiate with a lawyer. How many of you know that, friends, God is calling you? Some of you are going to get invited to go to a grace group this week. Somebody's going to call and say, hey, we're getting together with a full few people, and we're reading the Gospel of Mark together, and we're going to talk about what we're learning, and we're going to pray for each other and encourage each other. How many of you know that when someone invites you to be in a group like that, that's God calling you to follow him? Over the next five weeks, we're going to follow Jesus through the Gospels as he disciples the disciples. And I'm inviting you right now, this word to call, it means to, with a loud voice, to invite, to call someone by name. And friends, God is calling you to come so that you can learn what it means to really follow him and grow spiritually. And what will happen is this, he will turn water into wine. You can exchange 
ordinary living for an extraordinary life. Listen to what it says in 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 24. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 24. Short but powerful verse. Simple but profound. Listen to what he says. Paul's talking to the church at Thessalonica. He's saying that God is going to sanctify you. He's going to keep you blameless and pure. In other words, God is going to be at work in your life and take you all the way to the finish line. And verse 24 says this, The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. Friend, you can be available. You can answer his call. You can show up. You can take seven minutes a day and read his word and pray. You can join with other people in a small group. You can get involved in church. You can show up. But I'm going to tell you what really matters is that the one who calls you is faithful. And God's word says he will do it. He is the one that is at work in your life. What you, you're the canvas. He's the artist. You simply have to be available for the master to work. Friends, you are a masterpiece in the making. And the Bible says we are the, he is the potter, we are the clay. And maybe somebody's here today and they say, Pastor Stephen, if I'm a piece of art, I must be some jar of clay that's been thrown on the ground and broken in a hundred pieces. I feel shattered and battered and I'm struggling and I'm hurting. Hey, listen, that's why he says we're clay. Because when clay is broken, what do you do? You just heat it up and you go back to work and you make it and you mold it, you shape it, you form it into whatever you want it to be. Friend, if you're willing to let your life be in God's hands, he'll make something beautiful out of your life. One of my favorite verses in the Old Testament is Psalm 37 that says, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Have you ever heard that verse before? Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desire of your heart. Did you know the Hebrew word for delight is one of the richest word pictures in the Old Testament. And when God says, if you'll delight yourself in me, that word literally means to become pliable. To be pliable. What it's saying is this. If you will take your heart, if you'll take yourself, if you'll take your life, and you will be like Play-Doh in God's hands, he says that's the way you can have the desires of your heart. Jesus said, if you try to find your life, you're going to lose it. But if you lose your life for my sake, you'll really find it. See, the way to experience an extraordinary life is not to sit down and have a dream session with a poster board and figure out everything you want out of life. In fact, that is a recipe for slavery. Slavery to sin, slavery to self, that is a, that is a, uh, that's a path towards frustration and discouragement. The secret is to sit down and say, God, I want what you want for my life. Are you willing to pray that prayer? God, I just want what you want for my family. God, I want what you want for my business, for my work life. God, I just want what you want. And here's what happens. If you'll delight yourself in the Lord, if you'll be like Plato in his hands, friend, he will give you the desires of your heart. Everybody needs a compass. The Bible says he sees you. Everybody needs a map. The Bible says he calls you. You can write that down. He calls you. He calls you to follow him. The one who calls you is faithful and he will do it. And finally, look at the end of those verses. Not only does everybody need a compass and everybody needs a map, but thirdly, everybody needs a passport. Verse 17, follow me, Jesus said, and I'll send you out. Verse 18, at once. Do you see that word, at once? At once they left their nets and what? And followed him. Verse 20, 
without delay. Do you see that word, those words? Without delay. Remember the previous verse, at once, without delay? That's the same word in the language of the New Testament. You know that word is used 11 times in chapter 1 alone? It's one of the most common words in the Gospel of Mark. I think it's like 30 or 40 times in 16 chapters, Mark, the writer, under the inspiration of the Spirit, says, at once, without delay. Sometimes it's translated immediately. Other translations say, suddenly. Everything Jesus did, friends, Jesus was never in a hurry. He was always on time. And Jesus says, if you're going to follow me, he called them suddenly. And they left their nets. They left their father. They left the hired men. They left everything behind. And immediately, they turned and followed him. How many know that obedience, listen to this, obedience is either immediate or it's not obedience. (laughs) Obedience is either immediate or it is not obedience. Jesus said, follow me. And the Bible says, at once, they left their nets, they left their father, they left the boat. Friend, they left their family, they left their job, they left their home, and for three years, they followed and focused on knowing Christ. And I'm going to tell you, everybody needs a compass, everybody needs a map, and everybody needs a passport. And here's your passport to a new life. It is obedience to God. It's taking God at his word and saying yes. And here's what it means. He sees you, he calls you, and thirdly, he leads you. He leads you. The Bible doesn't say, uh, the Lord is my rancher. The Bible says, the Lord is my what? Shepherd. Friend, God doesn't drive us like a rancher. We're not cattle to him. We're not just a number to him. The Bible says a good shepherd calls his sheep by name. The difference between a rancher and a shepherd is that a rancher drives the sheep, sometimes with dogs, some, sometimes on horseback, pushing them and driving them. But what does a shepherd do? A shepherd leads them with his voice. And the sheep hear his voice. And the Bible says, sheep will follow the shepherd. Why? Because they know that shepherd is taking them to food, taking them to safety. They, they follow the shepherd because they know the shepherd cares for them. They're not just a number. They're not part of the herd. But they have a name. That God, he sees you. He calls you. And Jesus leads you, and your passport to experiencing an extraordinary life is simply following Christ and being obedient to him. I want to show you a great verse. Look at 2 Corinthians 10, verse 5. 2 Corinthians 10, verse 5. We have that, guys? It says, we demolish arguments. Now, this is Paul, his second letter to the church at Corinth, and in the heart of that letter where people are struggling, they're going through trouble. He's trying to encourage them. They're they're being persecuted, they're suffering, they're in trials, and and they're in troubles, and God's comforted them in their troubles. He says, now we demolish arguments and every pretension. Notice those, those words. Paul says, we're dealing with arguments and every what? Pretension that sets itself up against what? The knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. See, the issue of obedience does not start with your hands and your feet. The issue of obeying Christ It doesn't start on the behavioral level. The issue of obedience starts on the spiritual level. Behind every sin is a lie 
that I'm believing. So the way to deal with sin and the way to deal with following Christ is to start with my thinking. What is it that I'm thinking? Let me ask you a question. Now, don't raise your hand, but just think about this for a minute. How many of you spend time every day consistently, faithfully, alone with God, praying and reading his word? Now, don't raise your hand, but I want you to think about it. How many of you do that every day? It is a spiritual discipline in your life. Are you thinking about it? That's a yes or no question. Okay? Do you spend time every day alone with God in prayer and his word? All right. Now, everybody just go like this. <sighs> go like that. Are you ready? <sighs> this is not a guilt trip. Now, to make this much more fun and entertaining, let's forget about you and let's think about other people. Are you ready? Why do most people say they don't do that every day? Read the Bible, pray. What are some of the reasons? Help me out. I don't have enough time. What else? I can't understand what I, I read something, I don't even know what I read. I'm going to do it later. What else? I'm too busy. I don't have time. I'm going to do it later. I don't understand. Does this all make sense? Now, would you agree with me that all those reasons are really just excuses? They're really just arguments and pretensions. How many of you know that the worst lies are the ones you tell yourself? Remember when I was in college, I was involved with a group called Campus Crusade. And Campus Crusade at the campus of Florida State University, which was a party school, very secular, liberal campus, and there was a lot going on, a lot of temptation. So this, this organization helped college students, you know, seek to follow Christ and grow, and we would be in discipleship groups. We had a weekly meeting, and we did a lot of evangelism on campus, and so I was really involved in that group basically all four years that I was a student at Florida State. And one of the things that, that we had was we had, besides our weekly meeting and our discipleship groups, we had, uh, we had fun, we played basketball, we did different things. There was a church downtown right on College Avenue that had a big gym that they let us use. And so once a week, we would play basketball in the gym. And then we also had a Methodist church in the neighborhood right there on campus almost that would let us use their sanctuary for like a prayer chapel. And so once a week, there was a prayer meeting, and once a week, there was a basketball pickup game. And I was in Campus Crusade for four years. And at one point, someone said to me, hey, Steve, I didn't see you at prayer on Thursday. And I said, yeah, I couldn't make it. You know, I didn't make it today. Um, maybe, you know, I'm going to try to be there next week, you know, yada, yada, yada. And at that afternoon, I thought about it when I showed up at the basketball pickup game at the church on College Avenue. And I realized that for four years, I don't think I ever missed a basketball game in four years. And it seemed like every week, emergencies would pop up. And I wasn't so faithful at the prayer meeting as I was at the pickup game. And I was confronted with the reality of my own heart and what I valued, and what was really important to me. You know, the great football coach Lou Holtz has a saying. If you have something to write with, you might want to just jot down the word win. W-I-N. Write down the word win. And here's the secret to winning. Now, Lou Holtz is now not a coach anymore. Now he's a motivational speaker. And uh, he says the secret to winning in life, whether it's in sports or business or finances or whatever. The secret to winning is just three words. Are you ready? W-I-N. Here's how you win. You ask yourself, what's important now? Every day, you ask yourself, what's important now? And then you take action 
I'm not saying, <coughs> I'm not saying what's urgent now. He says what's important now. How many of you know <coughs> that what's important often doesn't seem to be urgent? And what is urgent rarely is important. So many of us live under the tyranny of the urgent. And what we need to do is live not reactively, but proactively, asking what's important now. What is important now in my marriage? What's important right now as a parent? What's important now in my school, at my job, with my work? What's important now in my spiritual life? What is the next step of obedience in my relationship with God? What's important now? And here's what you're going to find. Obedience is your passport to a brand new life. Everybody got a passport? Anybody been out of the country in the last 12 months? Where'd you guys go? England, Spain, somebody else. Where'd you go? New Hampshire. Seems like another country. <laughs> what else? My daughter, this summer, my oldest daughter, Caroline, went to London. She went to Paris. Um, pretty cool, isn't it? I have to borrow money from my children. That's where I'm at in life. So she's been to London. She's been to Paris. Isn't that amazing to go all over the world? How many of you have gone to foreign countries? Isn't it kind of cool getting your passport stamped? Do you ever like go through your passport and look at all the places <coughs> where you've been? My dad's a former FBI agent. He was a special agent in the FBI back in the what early 60s or so. My dad worked in the Dallas field office of the FBI after the assassination of President Kennedy. So his boss was the guy who led that investigation. So if you ever want to talk conspiracy theories, and how, how nonsensical all that is, you can talk to him. But when you went on a mission trip to Russia and China, uh, those people in China and Russia, when they punched your name in and looked you up, all of a sudden they wanted to have some interesting conversations with this potential spy because he had this background with American intelligence. Where you go, you, you, you get your passport stamped, other countries can see where you've been. My brother had his car taken apart on the tarmac uh, of an airfield one time. His automobile was taken apart like in a movie as they searched through his vehicle for drugs because he was traveling all over Europe. And, uh, and, and he just, he, he came up as a suspicious traveler because of all the different places that he's been. Where have you been? Let me ask you this question. If you had a spiritual passport, what would your passport say about your walk with Jesus? Your, your journey of following Christ? When it comes to the issue of prayer, would your passport be stamped? that you, you have a prayer life that's active and faithful and consistent? When it comes to the idea of reading the Bible, would your passport be empty? Did you miss that day? Or did you take every thought captive to make it obedient to Christ? Let me ask you this question. Is there anything you're going to do today or tomorrow that's more important than spending time alone with God in His Word and in prayer? Do you have anything in your life that has more value to you than that? We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. We don't have enough time to read God's word. Every person in this room and every person listening to my voice has the same amount of time. Friends, you use your time how you choose to use your time. I heard a pastor say one time, 
He had so much to do, there wasn't any way he was going to be able to get it done. And he thought to himself, you know, maybe I should spend less time praying because I just have so much to do, I'm never going to be able to do it. And another pastor friend said, if that's really true about you, you need to spend twice as much time praying. Because if you're praying right now and that's your level of thinking, then you're in, you're in trouble. Friends, you are too busy not to pray. You're too busy not to spend time reading God's word. The more busy you are, the more challenge you have, the more you need to hear his voice, the more you need his vision, his mission, his passion. Has your, has your book been stamped when it comes to trusting God with your finances? Is your passport stamped? Are you being obedient? Is your passport stamped in terms of God using you to make a difference? Have you discovered your spiritual gift? Or are you using it to serve? Are you sharing your testimony and telling others about Christ, inviting people uh, to church and telling people about Jesus? <clears throat> your prayer life, your scripture, your, your uh, influence, all these different areas of life. Friend, obedience is the passport to a brand new life. The great doors of opportunity in life swing on tiny hinges called obedience. And Mary said at the wedding at Cana in Galilee, the first miracle Jesus ever performed, what did Mary say? Whatever Jesus says, do it. He said, go fill up those jars, and bring them over here and draw from them <clears throat> and out. They, they, he turned water into wine. You can exchange ordinary living for an extraordinary life when you learn that everybody needs a compass. He sees you. He has a purpose. Everybody needs a map. He calls you. He gives you not only a vision, but a mission. And everybody needs a passport. He leads you with a passion to know him and make him known. This week, I got an email from a guy I went to high school with. I started today telling you about when I came to Christ as an eighth grader. It was actually the summer between eighth and ninth grade where I, I surrendered my life to Christ. I got real involved in my church youth group. I started sharing my faith. I got involved in evangelism training ministry. I went home every day after school and laid down on my bed and took out my Bible, and I had a pencil. I didn't have highlighters. I had pencils, and I would shade Bible verses that I liked. That little brown Bible, I've still got it in a box somewhere. When you open that, virtually every verse of the New Testament is shaded, which kind of loses the value of highlighting when you highlight everything. But I would just run home and get on my knees and pray and read the Bible. On Saturday mornings, I went out with my church, and uh, we would knock on doors. This one particular housing project, uh, government housing in downtown Fort Lauderdale, right off of Powerline Road. I would go down there, those little one-story green buildings, and knock on doors, invite kids to come to our church to the, through the bus ministry. And I was sharing my faith. I had Jesus stickers at my locker at school. I put them on my tennis shoes. I mean, I, I was like gangbusters. <laughs> and I got an email this week from a guy who lives out in Cooper City, when I opened the email, I saw the name, and I recognized the name, but I couldn't place, I couldn't put a face to who it was. I just knew that that was a name I, I had heard from high school. Dear Stephen, you may not remember me. We went to high school together, blah, blah, blah. He said some very encouraging and, and nice things to me. He said, I looked you up on the internet. We were at a reunion the other day. My wife graduated a different year, 35th anniversary. We went to the reunion Different names came up. Somebody mentioned your name and what you do now. And I just wanted to tell you, I remember you back in high school. And then he, he went on. He was very encouraged. One of the nicest letters I've gotten in a long time. And uh, he said, I moved to Cooper City a couple years ago. I started attending a church. And he said, someone encouraged me to get out of the audience and get involved. And he said, and my life 
has completely changed. He said, the quality of my life is different. What he was saying was this. I exchanged ordinary living for an extraordinary life. That's what I want for you this, this month. For these 40 days, will you, <clears throat> will you see God's vision? Will you hear God's call? Will you be obedient? Will you go? Will you do what God asks you to do? Will you have a passion to get out of the audience, to get off the sidelines and get on the front lines and experience a life-changing relationship with Christ? We're out of time. Let me just finish with this story. One Saturday morning, <clears throat> I was knocking on doors in this housing development, housing project, and there was this one area where there was like a playground in the middle of these three buildings. There were sea grape trees, and it was kind of a shaded area, and so <clears throat> I was knocking on all the doors, but all the ki- parents and kids were in the playground, so nobody was answering the door, so I started walking through the playground, and I found a little boy, and I started talking to him. Where's your mom? She's right here. I said, it's okay if I talk to him about church and inviting him to church. Sure, go ahead. So we sat down, and I took a knee, and I started telling this little boy all about Jesus and how Jesus loves you. Jesus has a purpose and a plan. He wants you to know him, that we're all sinners, that because of our sin, it separates us from God. And so here we are, we're lost. We don't have any way to connect with God because God loves us, but he can't look upon sin. And that's why Jesus solved this problem in the person. God solved this problem in the person of Jesus Christ. He came to earth. He died on the cross to take away all of our sin. He rose from the grave. He's alive today. He gives us a brand new life. And it's not enough just to know this, but you have to receive Jesus as your Savior. You have to be willing to trust him. And would you like to pray and ask Jesus to come into your heart? And the little boy said, yes. And I looked in his eyes, and he had been with me the whole time. And I was so focused on him. I was oblivious to what was going on around me. And I said, well, if that's what you really want to do, we can pray right now, and you can tell God what you just told me. Let's pray. I prayed, oh, Lord, I pray your blessing on Johnny and that as he opens his heart to Christ, you will come and fill him and save him and forgive him and change him and give him a brand new life. And now, Johnny, if you want to pray this prayer with me, you just repeat these words. There's nothing magical about these words. But if what I say expresses a desire of your heart, you can tell this to God right now. And he said, whoever believes in him will never be disappointed. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Johnny, do you understand that? Yes. Does this make sense to you? Yes. Do you want to pray this prayer? Yes. And I said, all right, let's pray. Dear Jesus, and I heard like 13 people say, dear Jesus. <clears throat> and I was, I was very young in my faith, and I thought, isn't that awesome? The Bible says when one person repents, the angels in heaven celebrate. <laughs> and I thought, I can hear angels. I know I'm a sinner. Everybody say it with me. I know I'm a sinner. That's what it sounded like to me. Thank you that you died on the cross for me. Come into my heart. Come in right now. Come in today. Come in to stay. Just come into my life. Lord Jesus, thank you for saving me. And I heard all these voices say that. And I said, amen. And I looked up, and there were boys and girls all around me. Listen to me. There was a kid hanging out of a tree over my head, out of one of those limbs of a sea grape tree, looking down at me. And you know what I thought? I thought, there's more to life. And now I know what it is. Let's bow our heads and pray. Our heads are bowed and eyes are closed all over this room. If you're here today and you've never received Christ as your Savior, you'll know it. It's like he's knocking on the door of your heart, like he's calling you. He's saying, come, follow me. Today, if you hear his voice, don't harden your heart. Just say yes. Yes, Jesus, come into my heart. Come into my life. That prayer we just prayed. There's nothing magical or mystical about those words, but if that prayer expresses a desire of your heart, just say, 
Come into my life. Come in today. Come in to stay. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. He died on the cross to take away all your sin. He rose from the grave to give you a brand new life. If you know the Lord as your Savior, would you make this your prayer? Mary said, whatever Jesus says, do it. Will you say, Lord, this, this month, these 40 days, I want to get my passport stamped. Lord, I'm here. Lord, work in me. Work through me. God, I want you to stamp my passport in my prayer life, in scripture, in service, in witnessing, in faithfulness. Lord, I'm going to be here on Sundays. Lord, I'm going to get in a group. Lord, I'm going to take one of those Gospels of Mark. Lord, I'm going to spend seven minutes a day alone with you. And I'm going to ask you to change my life over the next 40 days. Will you make that your prayer today? Father, seal these words in our hearts. For Jesus' sake.